to do that. And with that, uh, we'll just go ahead and turn things over. Thanks all again for joining us. Great. So yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's safe and well. I know it's still difficult, but hopefully there's an end in sight. So, um, so yeah, so my name is Lucas Streslick. I'm a third year graduate student of architecture and I've been working to organize this final materials lab workshop of the semester. So we've had two this semester and they've all been online. So I've been working with Jen Wong, who just introduced is the director of the materials lab and a lecturer here at the university, as well as with Brandon Reitag, who's um, also in his final, final semester of his bachelor degree in architecture. So um, our workshop today on the topic of decarbonizing concrete will be about an hour long. The first half will be from presentations from our guest panel, and then they'll be followed by a question and answer session. So I, I hope people will think of some good questions uh, to put forward and take advantage of having these industry representatives with us today. So, and then on Thursday, we'll be having a hands-on workshop where we'll cover a couple more strategies, including the conversion of CO2 into artificial limestone aggregate from the company Blue Planet. So I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it's pretty exciting technology. So, um, so yeah, so basically these workshops attempt to address the huge environmental impacts of concrete. I mean, as we know it, concrete is a major contributor of greenhouse gases and next to water is the most widely used substance on earth. And as we're seeing unprecedented growth in cities around the world, in particular in Austin, uh, which is projected to grow by about 28% in the next 10 years to 3 million residents, kind of begs the question of, can we expansion take place in a way that mitigates the impact of construction on the environment? So our, our speakers today represent organizations who are asking the same questions. So First, we'll hear from Brandon Williams, who's from Carbon Cure, uh, a company that's introducing CO2 directly into the concrete mix. Uh, our second guest is Corey Miller, who's with Lauren Concrete, which is a large scale ready mix concrete supplier in Austin that has adapted their production to incorporate Carbon Cure technology. Uh, and our third speaker is Tom Ennis, who is a sustainability office at the city, officer at the city of Austin, who's working to lower Austin's environmental impact. So, I just wanna welcome Brandon, Corey, and Tom. Thank you guys so much for, for being here with us today. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So I guess I'll just hand it over to Brandon first and then we can begin our, our discussion. So thanks so much, everyone. All right, perfect, perfect. All right, thank you, Lucas, for the introduction. Let me uh, try to share my screen successfully to everyone. All right, let's see. Are you able to see the slide? Okay, good, good. All right, so good afternoon once again. Uh, my name is Brandon Williams. I am the Market Development Manager for Carbon Cure Technologies once again. So I'm going to go through this uh, presentation uh, quickly about reducing the carbon footprint of concrete and give you an intro to Carbon Cure and how we're working to decarbonize concrete. All right, so uh, I'll start with a question or statement uh, just to get everyone's uh, brain going as far as giving a real world reference. So uh, did you know the world's building stock is expected to double by the year 2060? Uh, as Lucas said, uh, there's a lot of construction on the horizon and we need to be conscious of how this will impact the climate. So typically when people think of reducing uh, the carbon footprint uh, in the built environment, they think of operational carbon. Uh, which is essentially the carbon emitted through the daily operations of your building. Uh, so like heating, cooling, lighting, and so on. Uh, that's gotten the lion's share of focus uh, over the years. And we made drastic improvements with uh, alternative energy sources and uh, government procurement. But of that new construction, uh, embodied carbon is expected to account for nearly 50% of the uh, uh, global emissions in the built environment. So embodied carbon is the carbon emitted uh, through the manufacturing, transportation, and installation of those building materials. It's essentially the carbon footprint of the building before the lights turn on for the first time. So with the new uh, construction emissions being evenly split between operational carbon, which uh, I just spoke about, and embodied carbon, 
this means embodied carbon represents a large opportunity to lower uh, that carbon footprint in the built environment. So now why we're here, concrete. So uh, as Lucas said, concrete is the most abundant man-made material in the world. It's the second most used material on the planet after water. Uh, so as a result of its sheer volume, as you can see on this slide, uh, cement production creates about 7% of the world's CO2 emissions and is the largest contributor to embodied carbon in the built environment. Okay, so uh, just to high level stuff, cement is the main binding ingredient in concrete. Uh, cement is not concrete. Uh, uh, concrete is the, uh, uh, the after product. Okay. So uh, this is where our technology comes in. Carbon Cure is working with the cement and concrete industry. We actually have one of our uh, partners on uh, this uh, conference, uh, Lauren Concrete. So we work with the cement and concrete industry to uh, utilize CO2 in concrete to beneficially repurpose that carbon dioxide to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete. So before I get into how we do that, uh, just give you a high overview of uh, our uh, company's operations. So now we are currently uh, operating in more than 300 concrete plants and our technology has been used in more than uh, nine, almost 10 million yards of concrete <laughs> and actively growing. If you go to our website, there's actually a live ticker that tells you uh, the day-to-day -day usage of concrete and the CO2 savings. Currently we are at 87,000 tons of CO2 saved. So uh, looking at this chart, I know uh, everyone cares about Austin. Austin's very close to my heart. Uh, I, I show this map uh, just to show everyone we are active in a wide range of climates uh, and uh, successful in the Hawaiian summers or furthest east in the Canadian winters, okay? So let's walk through how this technology works, uh, starting with the CO2 supply. Uh, the CO2 is collected from uh, large emitters uh, such as ethanol and fertilizer smokestacks. Uh, that CO2 is captured by large industrial suppliers like Air Liquide, Praxair, and so on. They capture that CO2, they purify it and sell it. And then it is delivered and stored in a tank similar to the one shown in this furthest right slide at our concrete producers plant. So at Lawrence Concrete Facility, they would have a tank similar to this that would get uh, CO2 shipments as needed uh, for their day-to-day -day usage, okay? So now how that CO2 uh, gets uh, injected into the concrete. So we have a divide, uh, diverter uh, valve box, which is our proprietary equipment that is uh, attached to that still tank. And then it meters and injects CO2 into the concrete as it's being mixed. Uh, we have a software that will then uh, integrate with the batching processes at the concrete plant and uh, it uh, meters and injects the CO2 based on weight of cement. So different mixes have different CO2 content. Our software is able to uh, do that seamlessly. And then to the furthest right, uh, this sort of spooky, uh, uh, smoky image to the right, that is actually CO2 going into the concrete as it's being batched, okay? So you had that in that slide before, you had how the CO2 supply uh, was captured and then delivered, and then here you have it being introduced into the concrete, okay? So now, uh, just a little bit of chemistry. I won't stick on this slide too much, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what is happening when the CO2 uh, is injected into the concrete. So that CO2 finds leftover calcium ions from the cement reaction with the water. And in the presence of water, the CO2 and the leftover calcium ions react to create nanoparticles of calcium carbonate mineral. Now, calcium carbonate mineral is a, another uh, term for limestone. So essentially we are creating nano limestone uh, minerals within the concrete, okay? So the key to this process is those nano calcium carbonate minerals are very, very tiny. Uh, roughly 400 nanometers in diameter is shown on this slide. That little sugar cube is what they actually look at, look like. <laughs> and uh, you definitely would not be able to see them without the aid of technology, but 
uh, these nanocalcium particles will then bind to the outside of the cement grain, therefore increasing the cement surface area and also increasing the cement's efficiency. So what we mean by efficiency increased in cement, uh, we mean uh, increase in compressive strengths for the concrete. Okay, so uh, this is actually some aggregated data from some of our concrete providers. Uh, but just to walk you through this, this is a compressive strength chart. So on the bottom, you have uh, age over time, and then you have uh, compressive strength results to the right. So in the gray, you have a control or let's say a mix without carbon cure. And then in the orange, you have a mix with the inclusion of carbon cure or a precise dosage of CO2. So what you see is you're able to get an increase in strength with the injection of CO2, okay? So increased strength sounds good, uh, but I mean, we're here to decarbonize concrete and uh, we can do better than improve strengths. So in this chart uh, is an example of an optimized mix. So essentially uh, we have that uh, a control once again shown in the gray. And then in the black bar, we have that control with a reduced amount of cement. And with, uh, with less cement, you get less strength. It's pretty straightforward. And then in the orange, you have that control or that reduced cement mix with the inclusion of carbon cure or an injection of CO2. So this is pretty much the bread and butter of our technology. Uh, you're able to get that same uh, strength classification and performance with less CO2, okay? So just to tie it up and wrap it up for you all, I know you have questions at the end of this. So you are reducing the CO2 content with a two-prong approach. One is through the CO2 that is mineralized within the concrete. And then the second portion is the CO2 avoided through the optimization of increasing the concrete strength, okay? So uh, thank you. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Hopefully that was clear. If it wasn't clear, write down your question and I'll be sure to try to answer it in the end. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. So yeah, we'll, we'll save questions for um, after all three presenters go and then we'll kind of have an open discussion. So if you guys have questions, just, just keep them for, for after Tom presents. So we'll move on to uh, Corey. Thanks, Brandon. That was great to hear. So yeah, Corey Miller. Sorry, Corey, you're on, you're on mute. Apologize about that, guys. Yeah, my name is Corey Miller. I'm the quality control director at Lauren Concrete. Um, started with them about a year ago. Um, and as soon as I got into the driver's seat over there, um, Carbon Cure, the introduction of Carbon Cure was kind of thrown into my lap. Um, Knowing about it from another concrete producer, um, I kind of had some some key questions that I thought I'd ask. But you know, getting into getting getting into the usage of it, uh, my my questions were answered fairly quickly. Um, main questions I had were, how was it going to attribute to my strengths? What was it going to do to my set times? Um, things like that. And through through usage, through trials, um, was able to find out that it really did nothing other than help aid my concrete and strengths set times and finish stability. So let me, uh, let me jump into my presentation. Short and sweet, I, I did steal one of Brandon's slides, um, so I will go over it um, again in detail. Today's front page, we were established in uh, 1986 by, by uh, Ronnie Klatt, one guy with one yeah, truck. I'm and here sorry, we are. Sorry, over sorry, we, I don't think we can see your slides. You guys see that now? Yep. All righty. Yeah, so a uh, small family-owned company started in 1986 with one guy and one truck and one mechanic. Um, basically did everything um, from servicing, dispatching, um, all the way now to having over 250 trucks in the local market, all the way out to Houston, all the way out to Brady, Texas. We have 23 batch plants in our batching system, in, our batch, in, our, in, the, in this area, um, and over six of them, almost seven now, we supply with carbon cure in our mixed designs. Um, 
Let me go back one slide. Yeah, so Lauren Concrete is proud to be the first ready mix concrete producer to partner with Carbon Cure Technologies in Texas to bring low carbon concrete to the Austin area. Our mission is to provide a world class experience to our customers, employees, and communities. We serve and we believe con the concrete industry has a part to play in the worldwide efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Um, what we've accomplished through the use of Carbon Cure um, from the beginning of September of 2019, we had our first plant installed with Carbon Cure. And from that to year to date, we have saved over 527 tons um, of CO2. Um, we have supplied over 40,000 yards of Carbon Cure. And if you could see, this is where we had started and we got our system in. And this is when I had started in um, June of this year and from then, I have created over 400 mix designs um, and we have supplied over 40,000 yards. Um, almost 30,000 pounds of total CO2 utilized and that's uh, over 5,000 truckloads, basically saving 684 acres of forest absorbing um, carbon, cure for, carbon cure for a year. Um, this is the slide that I was talking about that I had uh, Stolen from Brandon. So basically, you know, has, like he explained, this is this is our controlled and the lighter orange, and this is Carbon Cure on top. So what what Carbon Cure does? We get with their services tech, and they basically run calorimetry to see how reactive our cement is along with with Carbon Cure. So right now we have a dosage of um, 1.6 ounces, 100 weight, which is um, for every for every 100 pounds of uh, cement you got 1.6 ounces. So by the one day, you know, you're getting gains and you go up to three days, you're getting even more percentage of gains compared to your controlled and all the way up to 28 where you get only 10%. So then when you go over to look at your control to reduce cement to your reduce cement with CO2 on top of it, we're able to see basically the same, the same strength as what we are as our controlled with the reduction of um, total cementitious in our mix design. So right now we're we're about five to six percent, and we're looking we're looking to get up to seven or eight percent um, total cementitious to be able to save on that. So really, I mean, the goal my goal personally is to get up to ten percent to see how reactive we're introducing new cements into the market, getting those tested, um, but also looking at other uh, substitute cementitious materials such as slag or pulverized glass to see what we can do and come up with along with reducing the total, the total cementitious in our mix designs. Um, car, being able to use carbon cure in different concrete applications, we've used them in slab on grade, gray beams and footings, elevated decks, columns, piers, paving. We have data in all of them. The least amount of data we would have would be in our elevated decks, just due to the early strength requirements they are needing in order to stress the, uh, the post-tension cables in those decks. So we haven't really dialed in a really good mix design per se in order to achieve those early strengths, um, but that is in the works. That's something we're looking at doing because that is majority of your projects downtown amongst these high rises is uh, that's usually 60 to 70% of the total building itself in concrete. Um, so, you know, through the use of carbon cure, we may able to reduce uh, the amount of total cementitious in our mix designs up to 6%. This allows for less hauling of cementitious materials, which ultimately reduces the amount of CO2 released in the atmosphere. Our goal is to continue moving that needle in ways that we can further reduce our carbon footprint. And you know, this carbon cure has been a huge first step for us, but ultimately what we're looking to do is find new ways, new technologies in order to reduce that carbon footprint even, even further. Um, and then these are just a few projects that we've done. We're actually doing a project on the campus UT right now. It's the SEAY building, the uh, psychology building. Um, it's uh, 3,200 uh, square feet that we have poured. We target to be done 2022. It probably will go in the first couple of months just with the extra mix designs that we, that we have submitted um, to the past couple months. But uh, this has been a great project for us. We've gotten great feedback from the contractor on site and really look at it as a, as a marquee project. And it was the very first project that we got approved with, uh, within the city um, to, uh, to pour carbon cure on this mix. They were looking for 
reduced cementitious content mixes. And instead of having to supply a higher fly ash mix where set times and strengths might be disturbed, we were able to come up with carbon cure mix designs. And that was submitted um, on 80% of the applications on that project. Um, we actually just got a contract with HEB. This is the second project that we actually did with them. We did a smaller project to finish out, but this was the first big project um, over off Lake Austin. And this is 100,000, over 100,000 square foot. So we're, we're a good ways through that project. And uh, year to date, we delivered 6,755 cubic yards out there. So, I mean, a huge win for us, a huge win for Austin, and a huge win for HEB and all parties involved. So this is, these have been a couple awesome projects to work on. We're currently doing a couple more projects downtown, such as the new Google building um, right off of Riverside there. We're also doing the, um, the FC Austin Stadium for some of the civil work outside the stadium and uh, low-grade concrete, such as your grade beams and footings and things like that. So, um, yeah, we're, you know, we're tackling projects from the very beginning. As soon as we, we get a, um, as soon as we get a, a project invite in front of us, the first thing we're doing is going straight to the engineer or architect and asking the questions of, you know, do they have the experience with carbon cure? What have they seen? What, what can we provide in order to, in order for them to feel comfortable with the use of carbon cure on their projects? So it was a little bit of a hurdle in the very beginning, but the more and more that we've supplied, the more data that we've gotten across the board has really helped us in bidding and in winning new work um, with the use of carbon cure. So, and that's, that's all I have guys. So save questions for the end, but I do appreciate y'all's time. Great. Thanks so much, Corey. Um, so yeah, we'll just, we'll go right into Tom and uh, yeah, he'll introduce himself. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Corey. Cool. Thank you. So I will start sharing my screen here, hopefully. And you know, because I'm working on a laptop here, I apologize. I can't, if I go into presentation mode, I've got conflicting screens uh, and I can't see what's happening. So I, I will just show you my slides, hopefully uh, at a some level of magnification that you can see what's happening. Let me know when that comes through. Lucas, give me a, a yes if you see it. Okay. All right. So it, this, uh, my presentation short, but uh, it will highlight some of the big picture. So hopefully you don't get whiplash from going way down in the weeds up to 50,000 feet. But my job is sustainability at the city of Austin. And it's, it, my job is to look at the big picture here. Number one is cement kilns are the number one point source of precursors to ozone in Austin could cost us millions to, to address that. So any amount we can reduce the amount of cement kiln production is gonna be a win for the air quality in Austin. The other thing that's big to keep in mind, uh, I don't have a slide uh, for it right away, but the, uh, if my other part of my job too is looking at our carbon footprint as a, an entire city, we wanna be carbon neutral by 2050. What does that mean? Well, we have 11 million metric tons of CO2 we need to address. Give you a pers perspective of what we're talking about. So concrete, this is great. This is a great first step. And my numbers, I don't present them as to say, to belittle this effort. It's really, this is a first step of many just, and to communicate that. So let me just, uh, go on to the next slide. So yes, low carbon concrete, even though it's a small step, it has a benefit that's similar. We have a water, what's called a water quality protection program at the city where we have purchased lands, set them aside. Maybe you've seen some of them. Uh, it took $150 million in 20 years to preserve that. If we had carbon cure in its current format for all concrete in the Austin metro area, we would sequester as much carbon as what that program, and it has other benefits too, but what that program does annually, 36,000 acres of trees. That's what the potential is for carbon cure and low carbon concrete in our area. 
Uh, I here's a little graphic for you. To what echoing what Brandon said? Cement's like flour, concrete's like bread. If that helps it stick for you. Um, when I first got involved in this, you know, I'm a civil engineer by training, and we are you're beat in the head about don't do stupid things that are going to cost uh, the, the community or your client a lot of money in the long run. Concrete, as you folks know, it's got to last 50 or 75 years. What could possibly go wrong? And Brandon showed you some uh, good graphics that show, hey, this stuff, you know, we've got it all over the place, but you're asking engineers that have used the same sort of mixed design for a hundred years to change. That's a really big deal. And I take that very seriously. And so we look through all these different possibilities. I looked at, talked to the people. Ozinga is the concrete supplier out of Chicago. That's been using carbon cure successfully for years. And what's that? And so we looked at a bunch of different possibilities to say, are there unintended consequences? Because I've been at this long enough to know the world is full of unintended consequences from a design, materials, environmental perspective. And so I didn't want to be that guy. Oh, that guy. Oh, he's that guy who brought carbon cure here. What a disaster. Because I can tell you dozens of disasters that have happened. But anyway, so we looked at that. Here's a little bit of a repeat that says, yeah, we're looking at 36,000 metric tons fully realized. And that's, you know, I just share, that's what the city of Austin would like. That's a beginning. But again, we look at 36,000 metric tons per year CO2. That's great. However, we've got 11 million metric tons to deal with. We got a whole lot left over. Um, here's a little history on how we got here. Uh, back in 2019, had a lot of different activities, but I actually took this concept to our boards and commissions and had them approve a motion to say, we think this is a good idea, we should fully investigate it. Because I wanted our design engineers to have cover to say, you really, the, the decision makers really think this is important, you should pay close attention. And so I didn't want, because it's, as a government employee, you know, it's easy to, easiest answer is no, right? And I didn't want to have no. I, I wanted to uh, pave the way so this had the greatest possibility of a yes. And so as I, when I put this together, it's they had four facilities ready to go with Lauren Concrete. We had some good publicity, actually made it all the way to Reuters news story back in 2019. Um, so, you know, we got two important um, committees to support this, a resolution. We didn't really say we want carbon cure. We said we want low carbon concrete. And in the broader scheme of things, <clears throat> carbon cure is in the family of carbon dioxide removal technologies. That's what we're talking about. This is baby steps, first steps. Austin's never done this before, but we need to do a whole lot more, which may lead into your Thursday presentation, um, if I might. Um, this gives a sense of if you did Blue Planet in Austin, we could address 60% or so of our carbon footprint if we addressed carbon or Blue Planet on making our CO2 aggregate. That's massive. Well, can we do that cost effectively? Not today, but it would, that shows you you know, the carbon cure is the beginning and that's, and I don't mean to belittle it. It's a great step and I worked hard to get it. I actually had to get approval to work on it because I believed it would be a good thing to, for our community. But now we need to start thinking about big picture. How are we going to get from this initial phase? And I appreciate, you know, we want, we know, and I think the concrete industry is predicting in 10 years, you're going to have carbon neutral concrete. 10 years. So there's going to be a lot of changes in 10 years. Um, but anyway, but when we look at uh, CO2 aggregate, wow, like Blue Planet, a massive benefits, massive benefits. And that would be uh, amazing to get there. And the, you know, the amazing thing that Brandon, I'm surprised 
Brandon, you guys didn't mention the beauty of all the stuff we're doing for carbon neutrality, which is the only one that's carbon that's revenue neutral or pretty close to revenue neutral. It's carbon cure. We we're able to, you know, we're not talking about investing millions and billions of dollars to reduce CO2. This is con contractors love it. They're doing it without any kind of uh, law or ordinance requiring this. And that's a beautiful thing. And if, I can, if the private sector embraces it as a material, it makes my job infinitely easier. So that's what I have to say and we'll take questions. Great, thanks so much. And I'll stop sharing, yes. Um, excellent. So if, if anyone has a question to start, we can kind of just like see if questions come up and if nothing, I'll, I'll ask one, but um, if anyone has like a first question to start off, just uh, go ahead and ask or share it in the chat and, and we can ask it. So I, I have a quick question that just came up on that last slide. It said CO2 aggregate. Is it, it's technically an aggregate that you would mix in? Yes, yes, it's, it, well, it is creating an aggregate using um, some waste material to use CO2 in the formulation of that aggregate. So, yes. Okay. So, Suzanne, on, sense? On, on Thursday, we're going to be hearing from the people who are making that aggregate, um, and then we'll actually use it in, a, in an exercise. But, yeah, essentially, they're, they're creating the, the aggregate from the CO2. Sky aggregate is a term I use because it basically is aggregate comes from the sky. So that's a good term. Yeah, I haven't opened my kit yet for Thursday, so sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries at all. It's 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 gonna it's, it's a really interesting uh, technology. I think. I mean, like like Tom's saying, like how scalable is it? I guess that's that's really the question, isn't it? Right. Another term that I enjoy that we've picked up just in conversations with this group is stackable technologies. So it's great that um, Blue Planet could potentially be stackable with Carbon Cure as well. So I, I guess I have a question because you just talked about kind of the private sector accepting this technology quite easily. Um, have you found that a lot of people aren't in the industry? Like, have you have you had any kind of backlash to the technology and changing concrete mixtures, like you're saying, I mean, people are used to hundreds of years of the same mixture and, and they depend on these strengths of concrete. So like, has there been backlash in using? I, I, you know, excuse me for, I'm sure Brandon's got experiences as well, but in our estimate, like one of the people who write the specifications for the coal concrete industry says, you know, I got a quote from them saying it's time my, my, you know, my compatriots in the industry, it's time to reconsider the hundred year old mixes. It's time. And so get ready. And so I think that is a message to all engineers, architects out there that it's coming and it's going to be a decade of change. And I think that's hard part for us is to do it in a way that, you know, you guys know you want your buildings to last 50 to 75 years and, and we got to do it well. And Tom, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the 80s when fly ash was first introduced into the market, that was a big scare for multiple engineers um, due to its own certain own certain issues. But, you know, once we got through that hurdle now, you know, engineers don't want to see concrete without without fly ash for multiple reasons. But going through the same the same trend is what happened back in the 80s. I'm sure we'll see that with carbon cure moving forward as well. And now we have the unintended consequence of fly ash going away as we get away from coal fired power plants, not going to be coal ash. So you're going to have a higher carbon footprint of concrete just because we don't have that waste material available anymore. Yeah. Well, well, one thing that we've noticed uh, for our technology and a lot of the, the similar technologies coming down the pipeline is uh, just as far as uh, exposure, uh, once we tend to get exposure similar to Corey's uh, story, our, our technology really sells itself. Um, there is a value proposition there, and uh, we are working to uh, reduce the carbon footprint of concrete. 
So uh, exposure, um, there's a lot of organizations uh, coming down the pipeline. You have the Carbon Leadership Forum, which is a really good resource. You have the Architecture 2030 Challenge, uh, working to get to uh, zero embodied carbon or zero carbon emissions by the year 2050. You have most recently uh, the structural or the SE 2050 challenge, uh, which are the structural engineers working to get to zero embodied carbon by the year uh, 2050 also. And uh, structural engineers are very unique in the way that they handle most of the biggest uh, embodied carbon uh, elements, uh, the structural elements. So you have your wood, your steel and your concrete. And uh, these organizations all have, you know, different uh, varying uh, journeys, but I mean, their destination is the same, getting to zero embodied carbon by 2030 or by 2050. So um, with these sort of groups uh, sort of changing the minds uh, and then uh, platforms similar to this, uh, essentially uh, it, it really uh, helps our technology uh, expand because once again, our, our technology is stackable, uh, like Jen said, to where uh, we would be able to work with a blue planet, we would be able to work with a fly ash, a slag, and uh, other elements uh, coming down the pipeline. Uh, we're actually a finalist in uh, the Carbon X Prize, which is uh, a, a whole challenge uh, sort of built on trying to create uh, innovations uh, in reusing CO2 and repurposing it. And uh, one of our technologies uh, in that uh, prize right now isn't the CO2 mineralization that I just spoke about, but uh, with concrete, there is a lot of wash water. There's a lot of water that, uh, or wastewater that is produced in the daily uh, operations of concrete. So uh, what we're doing is uh, we're taking CO2 and we're sort of repurposing uh, that CO2 in the wash water to stabilize it and then introduce it in the concrete to further uh, lower the, the CO2 impact of concrete. So uh, we're, we're definitely trying to diversify our portfolio and have different technologies. Um, uh, we also will have a sky aggregate technology eventually, but uh, uh, I can't speak to too much of that now. But uh, yeah, we, we're working on diversifying our technologies, but uh, to get back to the crux of the question, uh, definitely uh, platform similar to this and uh, just being able to have this conversation and uh, having proponents like Corey and Lauren doing innovative things with our technology, it, it really helps because uh, concrete is local and uh, the, the tech, you know, a, a lot of uh, everyone knows uh, each other in this industry. So they're all talking to uh, speak to each other in the hallways and uh, having a good proponent like Corey or Lauren definitely uh, uh, gives us a good footing in the in the market so yeah so everyone feel free to jump in with your questions or again you can drop something in the chat if you prefer us to bring it up to the panel I have a question about how you're getting the word out to people like architects and engineers, because we have currently represented, you know, the, the private sector, maybe closer to the contractor end, and we also have the city represented. But what we don't have represented are the architects and engineers, maybe more in the audience, I guess. But um, do you find that you're having to market directly to architecture firms, engineering firms, or is this going to be something that is adopted more in terms of code? on maybe on Tom's end. Well, I, I would say at least what it, our experience thus far, because we, it, to be honest with you, it's not approved by the city of Austin yet. So an amazing thing is, you know, hats off to Lauren for, you know, getting, selling it into the private sector, because I think it's as, Corey, I think was sell, saying or Brandon, what, but it sells itself, you know, you want, Hey, would you use this stuff that cures faster that costs about the same amount of money? Yes. Well, does it perform the same? Yes. So, you know, cause time's money on the job, you know, the sooner you can move on to the next trade when the, when the strength is reached, you're saving money. So, and what we've got at the city, we've got engineers who are concerned about standards and, and protocols and whatever. So we're working slow and, you know, I respect that slowness because unfortunately, you know, they're terrified to maybe 
that's a little bit of a stretch, but they're terrified of, of that idea of making changes to something that's been around for a hundred years. I mean, and this is an industry that you graduated from years and years and decades ago, and you never thought it would change. And here we are, you know, and, and it's a unexpected change dropped in their lap. And I think it's, they're, they're working at it. And I think we're going to get there. So it's just, but it does, I believe it sells itself. And that's why the private sector, uh, there's been no city council action. There's been no code rewrite, nothing. Yeah. Why? And why is it being, why is it happening? Because it, it's an awesome product and contractors love it. Yeah. And, and just to, to, add this, to add to that a little bit, I know Austin uh, is the, the basis of this uh, uh, conversation, but we have done uh, pilot programs in uh, some other markets um, uh, in Hawaii, uh, which I hope all of you will uh, have gotten a chance to go and see, or will get a chance to go and see, you know, after uh, we're through this, uh, this crux that we're in now. Um, we did a pilot program with the Hawaiian Department of Transportation, and uh, that, that pilot program went so well that we're now uh, approved by the State Department of Transportation. So uh, there are instances where uh, we are able to introduce a market and uh, if uh, they're more, uh, uh, sometimes things move faster than others. Uh, you know, some states are bigger than others, but uh, uh, we were able to actually get state approval uh, on our technology. So yeah, it, we do start uh, with uh, the architects and the engineers and the, the, the private sector just because um, uh, it, it's, you know, we were able to have a, a conversation and then there, after we introduce our, uh, technology, things, uh, can, can change a little faster, but, uh, the ultimate goal is, uh, to definitely get, um, uh, acceptability of our technology, um, in, through the, the, the public sector, uh, cause I, I believe the public sector, I was looking at a statistic, I, I think. Is it 55% of uh, all of the concrete used uh, in, in America is used by the public sector? I think it's something like that. So that's a big number that uh, we, we definitely need to try to, to work towards just to decarbonize in general. Yeah. And that's exactly, you know, we kind of piggyback off that. Um, we, we try to get in front of engineers and architects with that same, with, with, with that, with that same um, approval from the, uh, the state of Hawaii and other places like Portland, Oregon and, and Chicago, where it is approved and they are using it, you know, we, we try to get those two parties in contact so they can give them a little further um, in-depth knowledge of, you know, what they have seen on their end and, and all the testing that they have done. So um, if it's not likely or it hasn't been, it's been very rare that we've seen it specced into work. Um, but on our end, what we do is then get it in on the front side. Uh, I would say 90% of our, our concrete submittals, not everything that we submit has carbon cure in them, um, except city and state work and a lot of the high strength, high rise work, but everything else, that's how we, we push everything out and submit everything with carbon cure in our mix designs and try to get it in front of the engineer as quick as possible so we can explain what we're doing and why we're using the technician technology and what benefits it, it has and can bring to the local market. And it helps us in the, for the private sector, you look at somebody like Lauren concrete and not to blow smoke, Corey, but just like, you know, that's like the, they're like the go-to steady concrete supplier that everybody trusts and been doing for years. And so the fact that you guys are using this, speaks well for the technology itself. It's not just, hey, this guy in a garage somewhere thought about this thing and is bring it to market. It's, it's the company that these corporations and engineers have depended on for decades. Well, I guess yeah, I'm, and our, oh, sorry, go ahead, Corey. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, you know, as, as a quality, a quality control uh, director in, in my type of field, I like to sleep at night. Um, I don't like phone calls about low, low strength concrete or set time. So if it wasn't something that I felt was, was worth it and, and it didn't bring benefits to, to our concrete applications and our mix designs, um, we wouldn't use it. So for it, for it to work and for us to be submitting it on everything, kind of it, go, it goes a long way. And I know we're at 6% cementitious reduction right now. You know, like I said, my goal is to get to 10% and even further. So whatever we can do to reduce the carbon footprint, we're going to do. Um, we're going to do with every step of the uh, with the with the process. So,
So I have a question for Brandon, um, and I'm assuming the answer is yes, but just for, for due diligence. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the, um, the carbon that, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, you know, obviously there's a, a bit of energy that goes into the process of capturing carbon, purifying mm -hmm. it, and putting it back into the mix, which itself then is creating, you know, some carbon. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that has been accounted for in the, you know, yeah, so calculations of the net, net benefits. Yeah, so there are uh, a couple of um, uh, companies that do uh, sort of environmental product declarations, or they call them EPDs. And uh, uh, essentially what they, it is, is a, it's like a nutrient um, a label. Uh, like if you were to buy like a box of cereal or something on the, the back, it would tell you the calories, the sugar and all, all those sort of things. Uh, we, we have uh, EPDs uh, on our technology and uh, typically uh, the uh, carbon capture is about, uh, we're, I believe it's roughly 13% of the uh, CO2 uh, that is captured. 13% of the, the loss in that uh, CO2 capture is due to the production. So um, yes, uh, the, all of the, the if, if we were uh, using more CO2 to capture <laughs> than actually uh, sequester and, and offset, you know, uh, we, we wouldn't be in business very long. Uh, but uh, through things like environmental product declarations and third-party verifications, uh, that CO2 or the, um, the operational carbon uh, as a result of uh, the capturing, the cleaning, and then the um, uh, delivery of the CO2 is about uh, 12, 13%. Very cool, thanks. I had a follow-up question about that collection process. Um, I was curious, you said you, pay, you partner with uh, high emitters and uh, does that partnership require that they emit pure CO2 or are you able to filter out CO2 from say a larger like uh, batch of emissions? So my, my presentation is actually a little longer than uh, the time slot that I was in today, but I actually have a portion that uh, covers that, but uh, I'll try to speak to it a little bit. So the CO2 that uh, we're, uh, we actually don't capture any of the CO2, but we do rely on uh, those uh, industrial uh, gas suppliers. And, but the, it's an actual re robust uh, supply chain because it's the same CO2 that gets used by the carbonated beverage industry. So if you drink uh, sparkling water, beer on the weekends maybe, or uh, soda, uh, that CO2 always remains as a gas. So when you open the, CO, when you open the beverage, the, that CO2 goes back into the atmosphere. So essentially what we're doing is uh, rather than uh, keeping that CO2 as a gas, we take it and then we sequester it into concrete and then we store it away on a geological scale of time. So uh, I, as far as uh, the supply chain that we have right now, we rely on the carbonated beverage industry just because it's very robust, uh, but we are working to find other um, uh, ways of uh, catching the, capturing the CO2 supply. Uh, we've actually partnered with, and I should know this, but uh, <laughs> we partnered uh, with a cement plant in the past, and we also have some, we partnered with cement companies in the past, let me just say that, and uh, we've actually proven that uh, it, it's possible to capture CO2 from uh, their facilities. And I think that'll definitely be the future. Um, just listening to Tom, I mean, just being able to capture some of that CO2 from some of these CO2, uh, from those cement manufacturing plants, and then just sequester that into concrete. I mean, that's pretty straightforward to me and somebody will find a way to monetize it. Right now we are uh, pretty much the uh, only technology that allows you to sequester that uh, CO2 and repurpose it into concrete. So uh, hopefully we'll find other means to take that CO2 and, uh, or to capture CO2 from uh, other means, but yes. And in, in short, the CO2 that we use is the same CO2 from the carbonated beverage industry. Thank you. Got a question there, don't you? I do see it, right? I do see that question. So uh, I'm, not, pop up. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's been used in permeable concrete. I am pretty familiar with permeable concrete because um, uh, it, it's been used quite a bit um, uh, in, in some of my previous roles. Uh, I know permeable concrete has a very high uh, cementitious content. 
Um, but I'll have to do some looking and, and see uh, if, if, but I, I would imagine that our technology would work just fine, but um, I'll have to look and see. To my knowledge, I can't think of any times that we've used permeable concrete with our technology, but um, I'll take a look. And then if I find something, I'll send it to Jan or Lucas. <laughs> Len, I would just uh, add to that. There are, there's a company that makes permeable pavers out of low con low carbon concrete so and it's it's a technology that they have not per perfected ready mix but it's supposed to be 50 to 70 percent less carbon in those blocks so if you know how permeable concrete blocks work you know they fit together but they have little spaces that you put a little bit of gravel in and that's how it absorbs so it's not permeable concrete in the traditional sense it is a paver that's designed to have water flow through it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. And, and thank you, Brandon. And I think I, I really, it's a not as high volume as some of the structural concrete applications you guys have been discussing, but was really curious more about the, the pourable, like porous concrete as opposed to the porous pavers, but that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, we, we do actually have uh, partnerships with uh, some masonry uh, CMU block companies. So uh, we are able to also uh, sequester our CO2 into a uh, CMU masonry block. So we've seen success with that technology. We've seen success with uh, that type of uh, pre-manufactured uh, concrete also. But I will look into the permeability and if I find something, I'll send it to Lucas and Jen. <laughs> cool, thank you. I have a quick question that might kind of work laterally to all this, um, but it's kind of in, in the form of, um, since you guys are all in the field, as to whether we use or are thinking about using complex microbialites to sort of uh, take carbon from the atmosphere at all um, and using sort of living uh, uh, things to, to sort of take those from the actual building interiors or even from uh, the exterior environment. Well, I, I think that uh, you'll probably hear some more about that on Thursday because I mm -hmm. believe the gentleman's, Mr. Blue Planet's research was uh, looking at coral reefs and trying to replicate the way coral reefs function. Now, I can't imagine we're going to wait the same time frame as a coral reef to be built, but it's really look, learning, it's biomimicry in some respects, learning from nature, those natural processes in a way that we can use that. Uh, if so, it's not exactly. And the other thing we have all around us in Austin, we've got, I did about 2,500 years of our community's carbon footprint is locked up in uh, limestone underneath our feet in Austin. And that's all put there by, uh, but it took a long time to get there. Um, and we don't really want to wait another whatever 100,000 years to make that happen. Sure. So I, th I think it'd be fascinating if you could figure out a, a biological way to do it quickly mm -hmm. um, as opposed to slowly. Um, it's mm -hmm. a great question. Yeah, that's, a, that's the trillion dollar question actually. <laughs> yeah, if you could, if you right. could pick right. that out. That's the trillion dollar yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. We, we had an idea to put an actual tank full of uh, microbialites on top of a building and then it actually siphons the air through that water, through that tank. And then, you know, the microbialites sort of take away the, the carbon from um, that and it sort of filters the air that's circulating through it. But I don't know if that was something that was talked about or anything that, um, you know, you guys were looking into. Well, there's, there is a, a smog eating concrete, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. Um, and where basically they're taking some of the hydrocarbons in the air and you get the titanium dioxide keep creates an environment where you're reducing those hydrocarbons into a consumable form for uh, biological organisms growing on the surface of the building. Mm -hmm. So that's a thing, it's not used so much in the United States. Spain, as I recall, Spain's a big user of that technology. Right. Uh, but yeah, that kind of thing would be awesome yeah. to do for sure. Cool, thank you. Looks like we have um, maybe time for one last question or maybe two, uh, but there's one in the chat. Michael, did you wanna ask your question or do you want us to just go ahead and share that? Um, I, I can just read it. 
Um, so my question is, what are some of the ongoing efforts to encourage the practice use of this concrete and uh, make it more commonplace? So things like lobbying, tax breaks, or grants. I'm just wondering if there's like any like partnering with like local governments or like at the federal level to sort of like make this the use of this concrete like more common. So um, uh, our like uh, th things like uh, carbon offsets are um, uh, something that uh, we see uh, being uh, beneficial in the future. Uh, we've actually just completed our first carbon offset protocol uh, with a company called uh, Vera. Um, and I could actually share uh, probably some of that information with Jen and Lucas. Uh, but essentially, um, uh, all of the CO2 uh, that is being captured by a or being sequestered by a Lauren and that CO2 savings uh, can be used as a credit or an initiative uh, to uh, sort of also give a return on investment to our concrete partners. So uh, those are things that uh, we're definitely planning on um, uh, pushing out in the future. But uh, that is something that will uh, definitely uh, push uh, the innovation and the technology if you could purchase a carbon offset and then also give that return on investment to our partners. Fantastic. So I think that takes us right to six o'clock. Uh, we want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, if anyone does have a, a burning question, feel free to email it to the materials lab and maybe we can pass that on to the speakers. Um, but definitely a very big thank you uh, to all three of them for being here with us today um, and for sharing your insights. Uh, it's really appreciated. So if everyone can just kind of join me in a round of visual applause uh, to thank them. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, for everyone on this call, uh, please be sure to tune in again on Thursday for part two of the workshop. Um, if you haven't yet picked up your kits, if you're taking part in the, in the hands-on portion, please definitely do that at your last chance is Thursday. And uh, we might even give your kid away before then at this point, <laughs> but um, we're looking forward to it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so thanks once again, uh, Brandon, Corey, Tom, Lucas. Um, any final words from, from any of the speakers? Hey, thank you. Um, this is a great platform and uh, decarbonizing co concrete, decarbonizing concrete is uh, very uh, important. Yeah, just want to thank you guys for letting us uh, speak our piece on, on behalf of decarbonizing concrete. Um, so thanks for y'all's time. And then as far as y'all's Thursday, is that something we we're able to sit in on? Can we get a link for that? Absolutely. Yep. We'll send, awesome. send that right over. I would just say keep those innovations coming, what I would encourage yes. you folks to do. So we need that. And, and you guys are in a great spot to do that. So look forward to hearing that more about that. Yeah. That's a great point, Tom. We're not, we're not passive listeners here. We're all active participants, you know, in these disciplines. So let's all um, play our part. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for being with us today. Um, we'll see you again on Thursday and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Take care.